Hey, hey, welcome to another episode of the Pit Press Podcast. My name is Ryan Tamori, and we are going to recap another home loss. Back-to-back home losses for the Lobos, uh, 80-77 against a very tall, very athletic University of Nevada, Las Vegas team. Uh, Let me get to the usual suspects or the gang here, my business partner in this endeavor, Mr. Eric Malton, May Man, how are you doing? I am good, Ryan. Yeah, good morning, guys. Was really hoping that we were going to be talking about some major improvements the Lobos were going to be making, kind of coming down this uh, mid-conference season to to kind of really turn on the Jets here, but not necessarily the case. But we'll we'll get into it. All the way from the Bay Area, which I'm sure is pretty ecstatic today. Actually, I'm not pretty sure it is. Uh, He's a two-time offensive lineman for (laughs) San Juan Mendoza, and he played basketball for Damian Segura at our alma mater, St. Pius X High School, not St. Pius X, uh, as I always hear. Mr. Richard Thompson, how are you, man? I'm doing well. Happy Super Bowl Sunday to all. I'm ready to chop it up here, though, about this UNLV and Lobo game. Thanks for having me on. Uh, Of course, as always. And uh, for the Cowboy fans, let me put on a hat. Let me turn my hat around for a Super Bowl championship that happened in the last at least 20 years. Uh, he has been a Cowboy fan since 1970, and he's the voice of the Western New Mexico Mustangs, Mr. Ed Nunez. How are you, man? Neff, he's sticking it to us, man, again, about them Cowboys. But, you know, hey, it has been a while, so I can't uh, – you know, it's true. Uh, and hopefully they'll win a Super Bowl before I leave this earth. Who knows? But, uh, hey, good to join you guys again. Looking forward to talking about the game. Uh, you can follow him at NM Sports Capper on Twitter. Um, he's got a lot of money on the over. <laughs> His name is Jacob Neff. Uh, what is it? 48 and a half now? Oh, I got it at 47 and a half. So hey, if it's 48 and a half, that makes me feel better. That's the, yeah, that would, I would imagine. So, uh, it is 47 and a half right now. Uh, Caesar sports book, uh, for the chiefs and the 49ers. Uh, how you doing, man? I'm doing good, Ryan. Uh, kind of like what Eric said, I was hoping to be talking about a win today. Um, and going into Super Bowl Sunday, happy with uh, the Lobos' performance, but uh, seems to be uh, the opposite today. So we'll get into it. But uh, as Rick said, happy Super Bowl Sunday to everybody. You know, probably still don't understand how this is the the day after Super Bowl is not a holiday in the U.S. So a petition for that. As much as I would love it to be, I think we have, I think we have more social issues that we need to address than taking a day off but i'd be all for it if they played it on a saturday night uh it's kind of insane how you can like nobody like the nba's done it like noon today two eastern and and then college bas- there's some good college basketball games on right now um we want to thank our other sponsors that make the show possible if you're looking to watch the lobos when they play on the road head over to turquoise desert tap room it's only a few minutes away from the santa ana star casino where if you want to make a bet on the over free plug for Santa and star casino there catch the Lobos other college basketball NBA NHL they are having a Super Bowl party it's probably a moot point at this point but if you're looking for a place to watch the game head over there stop by for food drinks and now college basketball again NHL playoffs NBA playoffs March Madness coming up turquoise desert tap room also serves the local brews on tap find them on Facebook and Instagram 
at turquoise desert tap room doc uh, turquoise desert tap room abrazo homes is lobo owned and lobo operated and a proud supporter of the university of new mexico athletic department and its student athletes join the movement and help abrazo homes build momentum by contributing to our friends kurt roth and drew herrick at the 505 sports venture foundation or the unm lobo club when you buy an abrazo home you become a part of the abrazo familia looking to build the perfect home in New Mexico, find them at abrazohomes.com. Eric, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, um, but affordable solar uh, ticket giveaway. You know more about it off the top of your head than I do. Yeah, well, two plugs here. But yeah, first, affordable solar. Uh, still running that promo with us, and it's starting to look like the Colorado State game is where they're going to provide some free tickets. But first, you got to go to their website. We'll provide the link down in the comments of the, the YouTube video, but also with social media links to go fill out their form, include the hashtag pit press in the comment section. Um, that'll kind of get them queued up to arrange a, a consultation for uh, some um, comparison on electricity and solar power transition. Uh, sign up, get some free tickets to the Colorado State game. Uh, and then also with a turquoise desert tap room, we're going to be hosting a live show next Friday uh, watch party that they're going to host. They're going to have some drink specials, some food specials uh, during the watch party hours only starting at 6 PM to close. And that's going to be for when the, the Lobos travel to Vieja Serena against San Diego state, another big win lined up for them. Um, come join us and come see us at the turquoise desert tap room. Do you say big win or big one? Big one, but it should be a big win. <laughs> oh, uh, I don't even have a joke there. Just a song. Hey, you know what assuming does? Uh, other news around Lobo land. Hey, the UNM. Hey, um, the the Lobos, the Lady Lobos, the UNM women's basketball team. Uh, they held Colorado State to four points and 12 and a half percent shooting in the final quarter yesterday in the pit. They outscored the Rams 15 to four. In that fourth quarter, and they won 62-46. UNM is now 17-8 and on the season, 8-4 and in Mountain West Conference play, and I Ogman had a double-double for the Lobos. UNM softball. Lobos dropped both games to start the Louisiana Classic. The Louisiana Classics, I guess. <laughs> Falling to Chattanooga, 4-2, and then Cal beat them 16-3 in five. So they got run rolled there. Um, now we will get to UNM men's basketball, losing to UNLV 80-77. I didn't have time to pull any sound bites, but here's a fun fact that was brought up by former manager under Steve Alford, Kevin McCurdy. I did not go to the Boise State game or the UNLV game. Guess who lost? The Lobos. So maybe I'm a good luck charm. Uh, yeah, so the Lobos are 0-2 when I don't show up. Um, I'll give my thoughts first, even though I didn't play the game. I was a little worried. When I saw the line at plus 12, I thought, that's a whole heck of a lot of points for UNLV. Um, I wish I would have taken that instead of the over, even though I hit the over, uh, by the skit, by the hair on my chinny, chin, chin. Uh, thank you, true Washington. But anyway, uh, this UNLV team has won 11 of 12 in the pit and has won three straight against UNM. They have their number. Kevin Kruger, at least over the last 12 months has their number. Um, you know, I'll probably get in trouble for this comment. I, I like Richard Patino. I don't know what the coaching wise. And again, I'm not an X's and O guy. But it seems like he's always completely outcoached. And I don't know. It, they look like the the shooting, and I'm going to let the basketball players get into it. Um, a lot of four shots, a big thing, and I'll ask you guys about this. Mash and House combined seven of 30. You're not going to be a whole lot of teams doing that. Um, I thought they rallied well, though. They, they are definitely tough. Uh, you're down 12, and you have the lead at halftime. Um, I think the Boone brothers are just their kryptonite right now. And uh, Wheelie and Dean Thomas, Eric, I'll ask you about that. Um, but, Ed, I'm going to start with you, and I'm going to backtrack. This is uh, uh, very hot water and the bubble watch for UNM because if you, lo if you lose, I think, three straight and you've lost two of your last – you've lost two straight home games, uh, again, the history with the NCAA selection committee is going to look down upon it. They have San Diego State as a four seed, who I still love and respect, or somebody, I think Jerry Baum does on CBS, has them as a four seed. So the assumption is they will win out, they will win the conference tournament, they will win the regular season in the Mountain West, and they're a four seed. I don't think they're worthy of being a four seed, and I'm a San Diego State defender. Um, but Ed, 
UNLV points in the paint. And this is where I go with the coaching. No adjustments made. 48 for UNLV, 26 for UNM. Your thoughts? Well, Eddie and Boone, you mentioned that. 48 to 26 tells the story. I think a couple of times uh, they, they're out-athleted. They've got athleticism. They've got length. It amazes me that they lost the Air Force at home by 32 points. That amazes me. They're inconsistent, UNLV. They've won three straight. But if you look at the length, UNM has struggled with length. We mentioned MASH, uh, 3 of 25. Uh, House 4 of 15, he was 10 of 10 from the free throw line. But uh, it's been a recurring theme when New Mexico loses that those two together combined usually don't shoot well. Uh, if you look at the front line, matchup six feet, six two, six two versus six uh, one, six five, and six six. That caused problems. Uh, somebody mentioned top and not getting enough entry passes. When you got length on the wing and stopping those passes, it's hard. It's come and then and then the strength inside. Well, we we've mentioned Mustafa Amzil is not a post defender. He's willing. He tries. The first half, he got. I mean, he just got bully ball. It's bully ball. If you're if you're that. I think it was uh, Whaley that scored on him, or it might have been a Boone. I'm not sure, but if you're if, if I'm scoring like that, and Rick, you played inside. If I'm scoring that easy, I'm like, bring it to me. I know this guy can't stop me. So I think uh, it was. And my son said this too. He was watching the game with me here last night at the house. Bad matchup for for you and uh, for New Mexico. Adjustment wise, unless we got seven two guys or you know six eleven with some brawn coming in off the bench, we don't. They don't have that. Uh, the, the, you know, they have what they have. Uh, you mentioned, I think it was you, Eric, that said maybe uh, they should have uh, thought about Mushila. He's six four. He's he's vertically challenged. He's willing. He, he you know they didn't go to him. So I, I think New Mexico made a run. Thomas absolutely barbecued cook. Uh, no house. I'm sorry. He uh, he cooked house. He did. And sometimes that happens. I you know sometimes a uh, his, his uh, house's uh, defensive pressure had no effect on that kid. And once he started rolling downhill, there was no stopping him. A fadeaway, fluid. Gosh, it's a great shot. How do you stop that? The only the thing I had a problem with at the end it was House is a great defender. We know he's a, one of the fifteen uh, defensive uh, finalists for the Naismith Defensive Player of the Year. That no, you don't get on that list by accident. But at the end, Thomas is fading away and he fouls him. You're, you're fouling a fading a guy that's fading away. Tough, tough defensive, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, decision there. All around though, I think uh, UNLV out physical, out tough New Mexico. Uh, and you mentioned Ryan uh, UNLV right now owns the Lobos, um, and, and and Kruger has uh, they won three straight. UNLV is, is rolling downhill right now, looking pretty good. While New Mexico has two tough challenges on Tuesday night and then on Friday night. So uh, that's my take. It's the gauntlet of death. It's not Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. It's uh, Richard Patino and the Gauntlet of Death. Rick, go ahead. I just had one stat to go along with that. The Lobos have been outscored five times in the paint so far this season, and they're one and four in those games. And I think, you know, other teams are kind of seeing the formula now that Boise used. And again, against UNLV, just packing it in the paint against us defensively. Um, so we'll talk more about that. But I just wanted to give that stat to feed off of it. What's the game they won? Do you know? I uh, can't rec I think it was one of the UT or Texas Arlington. I can't remember one of the early games against one of the lesser schools. I can't recall. That, that would make the most sense. Um, Jacob, I, I think this is going to be a PG version of what you think. Um, you were, I text, I wasn't watching the game with you, but uh, when we do watch college basketball and baseball together and we yell at the TV, especially when we have money on stuff, but um I, I could picture you yelling in. This will be, you know, again, the PG version. Your thoughts about Jamal Mashburn's shot selection. Um, and you've mentioned that he's killed the offense multiple times this year. Um, and other games we've won, he continues not to recognize when he is not on. And I don't, I like the guy a lot. I'm not just saying that. Uh, maybe he, I think he was, one, at least last year, he was one of my favorite players of all time in regards to UNM basketball, but just your thoughts on Jamal Mashburn and his shot selection and in their losses being a detriment, choosing my words carefully there in their losses being a detriment to the Lobos. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what it is at this point, but it almost starts to become like a, a battle between our guards of, I need to get my shots. I need to, I need to put up shots. Um, you've got to have awareness when you're not on in a night. And last night was one of those nights that it just glared off the page. I mean, 
there was a, he took a lot of shots within 12 to 13 seconds of the shot clock coming off of a screen, taking 17, 18 foot jumpers when, you know, they obviously they weren't going in, but the game was being called so tightly with fouls that if you don't hit that 17 or 18 footer, you're giving your your big guys the chance to get a foul on an offensive rebound, and you're not giving yourself the chance to draw a foul against somebody on UNLV by getting the ball down inside or working around, you know, the ball around the, you know, the flow of the offense. And you, you can't just go down there continuously and chuck up shots and and miss them. I mean, there were he was he was terrible last night, and it it had I think. I think there was 11. He missed 11 shots or 12, 12 shots, and 10 of them resulted in defensive rebounds for the UNLV running Rebels. So that was 10, you know, quick closed possessions within 12 seconds of the shot clock. And, you know, I, I don't know if he doesn't have the awareness as a player to know, like, you know, hey, I'm not, I'm not feeling it tonight or whatever the case is. And if that's the case, Patino's got to start knowing when he needs to sit mash in critical positions because he doesn't have the self-control to not take those shots. And, you know, I, I just, I, I just don't know what he was doing last night. You know, we were watching the game and it's like, I think it was even almost on back-to-back possessions. Sometimes he would come down, take a, a bad shot early in the shot clock, miss. They would, come back down the court again there was like two or three passes in the possession and he would shoot it again and miss and it's like well there's two open possessions in a game that's going back and forth and those kill you I mean they really do um so yeah I just I just don't I don't know what the case is but um you know kind of going back to a point that we were just talking about which is the guard shooting and the bigs not getting the ball is a huge problem in their losses. Last night, they were 13 for 41. The big guys were four for 11. So that's your guards getting four times the amount of shots than the big guys are. And how many of those 11 shots do you think were actually ran to get the ball down inside to the big guys? And I could give you the number. It's probably less than 25%. So they were those those shots are all coming off offensive rebounds or effort possessions by the big guys to put up their shots. You cannot win a game in the college basketball where the other team knows that there is no presence down inside because the guards don't want to give the ball down inside. It, it makes it easy to guard because they just know there's no there's no offensive flow. It, it's going to be one of these guards taking a shot. So you get these guys disinterested, and I've talked about that going back. If we go back to the Boise game, uh, 20 for 48 for the guards. Donovan Dent made 12 of those shots, which were most of them were layups. And the big guys, four for nine in that game. Look at the balance of where this where the offense is going. I understand we have three good guards, but you have to eventually work the big guys into the offense and make it a little less predictable for the other team's, you know, perspective. And I think we're starting to lose that identity. Uh, you know, Nelly, his last three games, four, eight, and two points. I mean, you've made him ineffective. So um, the guards are going to need to understand, yes, they're scoring and they're prolific guards, but you have to work in the big guys to this. Otherwise, you are going to continuously be predictable and teams are going are starting to catch on to that. You know, I've heard this argument about it's the first thing that popped in my head when you talk about the NCAA tournament, it's like guard heavy. And I know you get like the Kemba Walker performances, uh, Tyus Enos. I, I don't know why I think about that Boise. I'm thinking about our friend Eddie Dunn there, Jacob, but, uh, cause that he did that coast to coast in Boise. Um, I'm just thinking about last year and what UConn accomplished and Adama Sanago in the championship game, 17 points, 10 rebounds. That's a double, double. And they win by 17. He was the most outstanding player. Uh, how how did San Diego State get there? You know, defense. Uh, thinking about um, Mensa. God, what's his first name? Oh my God, Nathan Mensa. Um, and then I think about Creighton last year getting to the Elite Eight. And at one point, 
people thought last year, pundits around the country thought last year that they were probably a, a, um, a championship caliber team. And you have Kalkbrenner and then Shireman, who are big. Shireman's, I mean, Shireman's kind of a precision shooter. And Eric, I mean, Jacob, you could tell me if I'm wrong because you know, you know more than I do. Um, but he's a big guy. I, I, I just think about. I've always heard that you need point guards to win the NCAA tournament, and I just feel like you need bigs. And I think UConn proved that last year. Rick, back to the subject at hand. UNLV shot 49% from the field, and we have talked about the defense on this team. Obviously, points in the paint, you get those easy field goals. That's different. UNM shoots 35%. You're facing a team that's shooting 50%. You're not going to win many games. Right, and it, it wasn't just that they were shooting well. It was the way that UNLV was able to waltz into the paint in the first half. I mean, Thomas was literally walking into the lane on a lot of those layups early. And, um, you know, House was going to the hoop strong and his stuff was getting beaten up off the glass um, and going the other direction for a fast break. So um, I think Whaley is now my favorite player in the conference to watch. That guy is just a bulldog down low for UNLV. People just fly off of him. And he is one of the best dunkers, if not the best dunker in the conference. Um, so I love watching Whaley on UNLV. And um, I was just surprised at how Nelly even got bodied down low time and time again. They were just going over the top of him, and it didn't seem like there was much resistance. He had three blocks. Uh, Toppin had five blocks, but it really didn't seem like um, UNM could stop them anywhere, and Thomas just had that beautiful turnaround going. And I think even though uh, the Lobos played their worst game, we got to remember they're only one point away from winning this game. So as bad as UNM played, they were still right in the game, right? And I think um, looking at Mash's game, he he did shoot too many shots, but I don't think Patino can be afraid to change the lineups. If you look what San Diego State has done the last few weeks, they changed their lineups constantly. They brought Danny Trammell back to a starting position, then they move him back to the bench a game, and he's flexible with that. And he was one of the best players in the conference tournament last year, and he's able to take a step back and come off the bench. So... Maybe it's time to um, give Washington a little bit more time. And I would also wouldn't mind seeing on offense for the Lobos put the three bigs out there at the same time. We haven't seen that lineup since the first few games of the season. I'm talking about Amzo with Nelly and Toppin all at the same time. I would have liked to see that and just mixing it up because you see these other teams playing a lot of different lineups. And it seems like we're afraid to go away from our core guys. and. I can't complain with that because that's what's got us here and that's what's um, going to drive us forward, but can't be afraid to change it when it's not working. One of the things that I wanted to add to that, and we'll get in this down the stretch, is we've heard so much about depth. It was depth, 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 and defense. Eight guys played last night. The starting five, nobody had under 29 minutes. Jamal Baker Jr. got in for six minutes. He had zero shots, but he was plus three. True Washington played 15 minutes, and Mustafa Amzil. We This is a broken record. I, I Man, Amzil has played amazing since basically the turn of the calendar. He's awesome. Um, and I'll ask that qu question later on down the stretch. And, Ed, I'm going to go to you on this one, and I'm sorry, Eric, but being the big guy, and maybe this is a question for Rick, I would be okay with Forsling. Why was Forsling not in the game last night? At least throw him in there, use him like a chess piece um, because, you know, the post defense struggled. That, that came up on Kenny, uh, the Kenny uh, Thomas show. I was listening last night and somebody made a point about that, but I'm going to tell you, he's too slow. He's not athletic enough. And uh, Rick, you made a point about Nelly not being able to stop Boone and Boone's got the, uh, the post package. He catches feels. He, he knows where you're at. He's got the drop step, and he's got a beautiful uh, jump hook. He's a, he's athletic. He The length reminds me of Keon Clark. You know, he reminds me of that a little bit. Not the same player Keon Clark is, but if he gets it in there, he he, uh, he had a great game in Las Vegas. He had a game uh, last night. You can't put Sebastian Forsen in there. It's a it's a up-tempo game. You can't run with these guys. That's that's the way I look at it because you got a seven-footer, and believe me, at timeouts, coaches all get together. You see them huddle up before they even go to the huddle. So, the, you know, could somebody might suggest, hey, what about Sebastian Forsling? Nobody, he's not in. So that hasn't come up or it came up. 
and they they don't feel comfortable with him in the lineup. That's all I can say because he is seven feet. But remember a couple other things. He hasn't played very much. You're going to throw him in that situation there and expect him to produce. You haven't played Quentin Webb. You want him in there, and he has you know that's not the repetition uh, repetitions on the floor. How are they practicing? Uh, practice has a lot to do with it. So I, that's that's my short answer for that. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. Uh, they haven't had him out there for how many games has he not played? Five straight games, four games. So I, I don't see him as an option last night. Now with those gazelles, man. And uh, Wem, Wem, Wembley, what's his name? Um, Welly. Welly, the big guy. Rick, you mentioned guys bounce off that dude. That guy's a monster. Jeez, man, six seven, two sixty five. Forcing wants no part of that. He don't wants no part of that. He's not strong enough. Can't hold his position. You saw what he did to to Amzil and and Nelly. That guy's a is a beast. So New Mexico really had no physical matchup for him, and uh, so that that's uh, that's my answer to that, Ryan. I hope I pronounce his name right. It's driving me nuts, Eric. You brought this up, and his dad played for UNLV. Dean Thomas Jr. Eight of twelve, took one three, hit it. Eight of ten from the free throw line, twenty five points. It was a career high. Four assists, fouls drawn seven, two rebounds. Okay, I was reading that wrong. He controlled the pace of the game and dominated. Your thoughts on that? You brought it up. Yeah, <clears throat> Deaton's a five-star high school recruit, and he actually graduated a year early. He should be a high school senior right now, and he absolutely, like Ed said, cooked Jalen House last night. I think at certain points in the game, I thought House was a little too over-aggressive in guarding him. And Dean Thomas handled the pressure like a freaking fifth-year senior. Uh, he was really careful with the ball. Uh, I think he distributed the ball well. But you you mentioned his stat line. The one that I'm impressed with is him being able to draw seven fouls. Not many turnovers. He got into the paint. He was hitting some fadeaways. He was finishing at the rim. Knocked down some outside shots. I mean, that kid is probably not going to be in college very long with how talented he is. If he doesn't get plucked by a power five for for NIL, and I don't know if he'll stay at UNLV much longer, but he he was the catalyst last night. He was the one guy that they couldn't stop. Uh, kind of fixating on House here a little bit, not really critiquing his on ball pressure, but I thought it hurt them a little bit last night, just being a little too over aggressive. Because when you're over aggressive like that, and you gamble to try gamble on the steals or jump the passing lanes. You put stress uh, on the defensive guys behind you. Put some guys in in some out of position spots, and they gave up a ton of layups. I think a lot of that contributed to the points in the paint for UNLV. W with a guy like Thomas, after a few times, man, I, you got to make that adjustment. To I just got to contain this guy. You got to keep him in front of me, and I can't let him get to the rim as easily because he did make eight free throws. And down the stretch, that's when it really mattered. They continued to get to the line. Um, but yeah, Deaton Thomas is, was absolutely as advertised five star. That kid was tough. Rick, I'm going to you. Two subjects. The slow start yesterday. I think you, what UNLV started out to like a 11, what was it? An eight, seven, eight, nothing start um, before UNM. Finally, you know, everybody sat down in the pit. Um, it was like 11 to two, I think. Um, but one, I'll start with the slow start. And then secondly, UNLV limited their three-point attempts to stop UNM from getting long rebounds. Just your thoughts on both those. Sure. So the, the constant theme for the Lobos has been slow starts in the second half, usually, of these games. And unfortunately for UNM yesterday, they started the first half. I don't think they made a field goal till close to the 15 minute mark. You guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but that just totally took the crowd out of it in my eyes for the first half until they went on that run a little bit later and uh, really didn't get the crowd into it many more times until they went on a 12-0 run about midway through the second half to take that 57-54 lead when we saw it go back and forth. But the first five minutes of that game, I text you guys, it felt like a middle school game, the way they were turning the ball over. And it looked like nobody even wanted to shoot the ball. There was a little bit of hanging the heads running down the court. So it just felt like the energy wasn't there from the get go. And that kind of carried throughout the game. And I just wanted to hit on what Jacob was 
detailing about getting the bigs involved. And I've been talking about the last two weeks here is I don't think the pick and roll game for some reason has been used the way it was when the Lobos were excelling. And Dent only had one assist last night. And we wonder why bigs aren't getting touches. Well, they're not running pick and roll, right? And that's when Nelly has his big games, it's because he's just getting dump off passes and he's not having to do much, right? And the same for JT. So I think um, that's going to be critical for them moving forward. And on the UNLV side, what they're trying to do on offense was obviously get into the paint. They only shot nine three-pointers. And I believe that strategy was to limit the long rebounds and limit the Lobos from getting those long rebounds and pushing it in transition, right? And um, by slowing that down, it, it takes the Lobos out of their game, as we're seeing it, because when the Lobos are in the half-court offense right now, they're just really struggling um, to find consistent offense when Mash isn't hitting. And even when he was hitting, those were all contested shots. So um, I think, you know, changing up the offense is going to be needed going forward and having some more um, balance between the bigs and the guards running the show. Could, could I add something to that, Ryan? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's time to start letting Donovan Dent be the true point guard of this team. I'm tired of them letting House and Mashburn and them bring the ball up the court continuously because you can tell the difference between a set offense being ran and then when they bring the ball up the court. I don't know how many times last night House brought the ball up the court. They ran a screen for Mash to come in and shoot 17, 18 footer and the possession was dead. Donovan works everybody into the offense, everyone, whether that's motion up top, whether that's involving the big guys and or if we need to stop a run or get a offensive possession, that's going to be something with a quality look. He could take the ball to the basket and get a layup. Oh, we lost Jacob there. Hold on. We had a technical difficulty there. Jacob, go ahead with your thought. Sorry. Yeah, so just I, I think it's got to start being more consistent down the stretch for this team of who runs the offense and brings the ball up the court because there's a difference when Donovan runs the offense and there's a difference when House and uh, when House is bringing the ball up the court, and that's just my opinion. House out on the breaks seems to work, but when we're starting to run a half-court offense, Donovan definitely runs that more efficient. I'm going to stay with you there because this is something you had mentioned. You know, what the one thing that I had mentioned, the lack of players coming off the bench. Uh, last night, no Isaac Mushila, and then Eric, I'm going to go to you on this. No Quentin Webb. I, I don't, we don't, nobody knows what's going on there. I would think that these guys could would definitely Mushila, and Quentin Webb's a big dude. Um, they could add a lot of defensive depth. I don't know. Defense wins championships. Uh, I know it's football, Ed, but I'm thinking about Ned James in my ear. Offense fills the stands, and he's cliche and he steals it, but offense fills the stands, defense and special teams win championships. I, I think it's the same for every other sport. You look at hockey and baseball in the postseason. Pitchers and goalies get hot. You don't allow offense. Just, Jacob, your thoughts on that, on on Quentin and, and Mushila not coming off the bench. Yeah, I mean, uh, I heard – Ed's points earlier and they're valid. I mean, uh, you know, you, you definitely have mismatches no matter what, even if you put Mushila in the game or Webb, who's more of a lengthy, skinnier type of guy. <clears throat> but what really stuck out to me in the later parts of that game was the fact that he only played seven guys last night consistently. And when it came down to it, they were subbing guys in and out because of foul trouble all night. And nobody's really able to get into a rhythm. But then also at the end of the game, when everybody has four fouls, that's why they're getting so many easy looks in the paint and at the rim because you can't play contested defense because everybody has four fouls, you know. So that's that's something that I think Patino needs to recognize and say, okay, I've got some depth on this team. I have some guys with experience. Even though Mushila is six six four. He does sometimes play a little bigger than that, and you know he he at least gives the effort there. Uh, Webb is somebody that I think could come in and 
I mean, I'm, I'm not sure how he would do, but I mean, you have to maybe potentially at least try it. UNLV played 10 guys last night and most of their guys, some of them only had four or five minutes. Some of them only played two minutes. But the fact was, is they gave those guys a little bit of a breather down the stretch. There were offensive defense substitutions at the end. And when those guys can play harder defense and your guys stand straight up in the paint because they can't get a foul at the end to foul out, you know, it, it puts them in a bad position. So, um, you know, so I think maybe a little we, we talked about this earlier on in the year, the lack of post you know, presence and the lack of post depth is going to come back and bite this team at some point. We're seeing it right now, but we've also created a bigger problem by maybe not giving some of these guys some minutes to um, help us out down the stretch where we could rely on maybe two, three, four minutes from somebody, um, you know, to, to play some harder defense or something like that. You know, that's, that's to me what is sticking out there with the bench <clears throat> and it's just gotten a little too short for my liking. We were playing a lot of people at the beginning of the season. Now we've shortened it down to just two players mainly. And it's, it's, it's coming back to bite them sometimes. Eric, I wanted to go on you on that. Cause you brought up Quentin Webb, just your thoughts on the depth and who they're playing. Now I really want to hit home just the mismatches that Ed had talked about at the beginning. For most of the game, it was, it was house dent, and Mashburn, who are all 6'2 and smaller. They all saw more than 34 minutes each, right? Two Washington, who's 6'4", Mushila is 6'4", Quinton Webb is 6'6". Those guys combined had like 20 minutes, maybe. Well, actually 13, because I, I included Amzil in that conversation or that equation. But you have to rely on, on three guards, all 6'2 and smaller, to guard guys that are 6'6", 6'7", 6'8". Like, how do you, I don't, I don't understand. Like you got to, from a, from a matchup standpoint on the defensive side, you got to figure out something else. Like I, I know Patino Pai wants to mash in there for his, for his scoring potential, but he wasn't, he wasn't, wasn't it last night. He just didn't have it on the defensive side. He becomes a liability. And maybe that's kind of like an extreme or harsh rationalization there, but he is, he doesn't rebound. Well, he doesn't defend well. He's six two, right? Like maybe even six one. And when you have to guard someone that's six four and six five, I was a guard. I was a small guard, five seven, five eight. If I had to guard someone at five ten, five eleven, it's super challenging, right? Like he does not defend one. I think that's why the points in the paints matter, matter so much for UNLV. That's why they didn't shoot a lot from the outside because they exposed the weakness down on the other end. They just kept feeding the ball in the post because the Lobos had three guards on the court for a majority of the game. I would have liked to see True get a little bit more minutes, at least 20, right? Like just, just his effectiveness and physicality on the defensive side, they could have used a little bit more of that last night. I think they just got abused because they were they were smaller, uh, way a little bit less. Um, and then at some point, when, when are you going to give Quinton Webb his shot? The dude's a freak athlete. He's 6'6". Six, six. I don't know if he's just not getting it in practice. He's still a young player. Uh, sk offensive schemes, not really understanding the offense completely yet or really finding his way in there. But, I mean, if I'm Pantito, you got to throw him in there just to see what he's going to hold, if he's going to hold his own. Uh, and then from a size perspective, you got to put in someone who's going to defend and who's going to rebound. If that's their role, that's their role. you got plenty of guys on this team that can score. and. They just got physically abused last night, and they were just outsized, outmatched, and Patino didn't really make an adjustment to to go big. I think the one instant in the game where he did go big was at the end of the first half when the Lobos went on that 12-0 run to take the lead at half. That was when True was in the game. That was when Amzilla was in the game, and that was when Mashburn was on the bench. That's yeah, I mean, some we're hard, not, that's we're not hard crazy. Facts. No, we're not crazy. I mean, this is this is. This is what you have to recognize. And if we could watch it on our couch, okay, you have to be able to see that on the court or in film. I mean, it's it's killing them. Like Eric said, how many times can you watch something continuously fail before you? it's insanity? I mean, you've got to use the size. You have to. I mean, you just you, you can't just let it sit there 
and keep playing these same guys because it's it's killing them. So I, I don't I don't know what to say besides that, but every game we come back to, it's always the adjustments we're not making. And you just have to do that sometimes. Ed, Ed hold on. I muted you there. Go ahead. You know, to uh, to your point, Jacob, <clears throat> somebody else made a point about MASH. Uh, one of our listeners uh, re- remarked to me that last night he had a chance to take a charge and just stepped out of the way. He's not going to take a charge, right? He's not a great defender. We know that. The other thing is this, though. A couple of things of what you said, Jacob. I agree with you about Donovan Dan. He's the distributor, right? But Patino sees it as, hey, House can push the ball up in, in transition. He's got speed. He's going to let him handle the ball. There's no way they're just going to say, Dan, you're the guy. It's not going to happen. Now, you know, because they feel comfortable with House handling the ball. And sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. I would agree. Dan is the better uh, distributor. Dan is a true point guard. We know that. But Patino is sold on House doing that. That's what's going to happen. Same thing with Mash. Now, look, I'm not disagreeing with, with uh, you know, somebody had mentioned, too, they should sit him down. Does anybody here on this panel actually believe that Patino is going to sit him down? I don't. I don't. I no. mean, yeah, sometimes should he? I agree. Has it worked? Now, the, the thing that concerned me last night, shots off of the, of the pick, they weren't even on the rim. You know, sometimes as a shooter, I feel like, hey, that, that feels good. It's just been rolled out, uh, spun out on the rim. Some of the shots last night weren't even close. Challenged with length, kind of rushed them. Again, off balance, a little bit off balance to the left, a little bit off balance to the right. Shooting mechanics matter. His mechanics weren't good last night. Again, challenged by length. He's not. He struggles with length. We've seen that. A couple of points I wanted to make about what my son made. He couldn't be on this morning, but uh, Rick, he mentioned what you had said last night about the long rebounds. You mentioned that, and and uh, and they did limit uh, UNM's transition opportunities, but UNLV blocked six shots. If you remember, two of House's four A's into the paint. They treated those like ping pong balls, man, the way they swatted that stuff. That was like, get that mess out of here, right? They did. They, I mean, it was like – so that, and, and so I, I think uh, the things that you're suggesting, Jacob, the solid suggestions, but Tino is not going to sit mashed down. He's not. He's not. He, he's been dependent on the guy to score. Sometimes he scores. Last night was a frustrating struggle, but he's not going to – he's not going to go away from that. We know that. He, that you dance with what brung you. He's brung – you know, they brung him here. To a pretty good record, but when they struggle and struggle against length, I think he should make those. I'm not disagreeing. I've just never seen him do that, and I, I don't think he's going to do it with Mash being a senior, dependent on him. Hunter Green made this point. Let me make this point real quick. He had said Mash and House wouldn't average 20 points, and they don't. He was right about that, but I don't know that we saw that Dent would uh, come uh, develop so quickly as a sophomore point guard, one of the best in the country, no question. And um, Mash sometimes plays really well. Last two games, last two home games, struggles, struggled. And he's not the guy as a shooter. Believe me, I know. I, I used to shoot a lot in high school. I would keep shooting, you know, and sometimes it was wrong. I know it was. But he's not going to stop shooting. He's not. The only answer is that is, okay, you know, we got to sit him down, and he's not going to do that. That's what he's – that we've seen his rotations. But he's not going to – he's not going to all of a sudden sit him down. I'd be very surprised if he did that. Well, I, I want to add something real quick. I think both of you are spot on with that. And I think I'm going to come in and just kind of be the, the, the guy in the middle, right? I think there's there's a key to finding a healthy balance with that, right? Like, I think we just saw the extreme side of MASH where he was just looking to score first and 33 minutes to choose 13 minutes. when you got to find a balance on the defensive side too. And you got to find you got to take a, a hard look at the matchups that you create too. Lobos went small last night and they got dominated. You went six block shots that you referenced said with the ping pong yeah. balls, right? Like I, that's going to happen when you play a longer, more athletic team and you got three guys under six two on the floor for a majority of the game. I think you got to spell some of that with a little bit of length and put some of your own size out there to, to battle with those guys. Um, but at the same time, I think yeah, that that mash can get a little bit out of control sometimes and just shoot, shoot, shoot. It's like you got to take a step back and slow down and let Dent have the ball in his hands a little bit more because he's the one that can create and finish in the lane. Jacob, you're on mute. So my point is, is like at the end of the game, when – where we know we're not going to be busting out in like, you know, fast break points and stuff like that. House is still bringing the ball up the court and they're not letting Dent bring the ball up the court. Right. I would rather have him cause he could go to the rim stronger than house can 
on, at the end of the game, like for instance, like in the last 20 seconds, right? When you're, when you need to get a quick two and then hope that they miss a couple free throws or something, they've got house bringing the ball up the court and he's passing it to somebody and going quick and trying to get somebody open. I think Dent makes better decisions in those areas. That's, that's what I'm saying. However, I think it's time to bring up to that. And, and you could call me crazy, but there's been a major digression in, in Jamal Mashburn this year. And he's not what he was last year, even. He, he has digressed, and I know Patino's not going to sit him, but for the sake of talking about it, this is what's killing this team certain nights is him being so loyal to certain people rather than wanting to win the game. I, I just I feel like that's really hurting him um, because he has digressed and he has continuously done this all year. He is not shooting well, and if he keeps letting him, you know, with that long, 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 long leash – and and Nash can't do it and and resist himself from taking those shots. It's going to hurt this team down the stretch. Well, we all we have seen good Mashburn too, though when he when he looks to pass first. I forget sure, which game was it early early in the San Diego State game at the pit. Yeah, I mean that was a, that was a good house. I mean, good Mashburn game. If he can somehow switch the gear to playing like that a little bit more. Then, then Mashburn becomes a, becomes a huge asset for this team versus a sure. liability. I just, I just so think that the the bad has outweighed the good a majority of the times this year. In the games that they've lost, sure, like most recently the the Boise State game and now this game, where they faced length and more athletic teams. I mean, Boise State is kind of built the same way, right? You got Degenhart, you got Omar Stanley, and uh, what what's the other guy's name? The other lanky, Ogbo, Ogbo, right? Another. That's that's three guys six seven six eight six nine, like the Lobos just struggle with those teams and sure. you got to move the chess pieces around to kind of match that up and if you 100%. don't you're gonna struggle right like that's 100%. probably why he's struggling with his shot like at head mention mm-hmm. having to sure shoot over is. a guy with length at six seven six eight that's tough. Oh, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. It's just that you know it kind of stinks that. We have to look at it from that perspective. You know what I mean? Like, it, it almost looks like common sense, but it, or it's not common sense from his perspective. Rick, you look like you have something to say. I know you were laughing at the ping pong ball comment. <laughs> <laughs> no, I guess just to top it off, we have to remember it's just one game. Um, and yeah, it wasn't a good game for Mash, but a majority of the conference games, I feel like when he has about 10 shots a game, we're able to stay in it. But I think what Ed is saying about Patino is true. He's going to ride the horses that got him here. But I, I don't think you have to play the same lineups every night. It's okay to ride a hot hand. It's okay to let Washington stay out there. For God's sakes, he was plus 20 points in 15 minutes and six rebounds. Mm-hmm was clearly one of the most effective players on the court. Okay, that's his game. Let him play 20-plus minutes, whereas the games before this, Washington has not been as sharp. Okay, he only played nine minutes last game. This game, he deserves more. Mash doesn't deserve 30-plus minutes. It's okay to change that up with the ebbs and flows of the game, and I think that's what's hurting them, like we've just been talking about for the last 10 minutes. So that's all I wanted to throw in and. Yeah, it, it was ping pong season um, off the glass. Those were some fierce blocks. And Man. as a player, when you get your stuff beaten mm. up like that, you think mm. twice before going again. But let me tell you, at least House, when House is mis- missing, he goes to the hoop. And that's the difference between him and Mash. House was still 10 of 10 for the line. I don't know how many times Mash went to the line, but it was not maybe half as much as that. And four for, it, four for six. How many, how many times can you give a, a pump fake? off that screen and then go in and draw some contact or kick it back out. I think the inside outside game is totally lacking. And if the Lobos are lucky enough to get into the NCAA tournament, this is just the beginning of the physical teams we're going to see. If they have to face a team from the big East, good luck. It's going to be the same thing, maybe times 10. So um, some changes are going to be just, it's, this team's going to have to keep evolving game by game. It's not going to have to be the same thing every game is the way I look at it. Two things. I'm going to go to Jacob on that because I still think about two years ago, Remy Martin transferring to Kansas 
from Arizona State. I mean, he was a stud at ASU. He came off the bench. Uh, I mean, and then you had uh, Christian Brown and um, uh, Ochai Abaji. I mean, they were they were three big studs, and they kind of played selflessly. I I, I wish that Jamal Mashburn would be that hero. I personally would be that hero off the bench where he comes in for 20 minutes and he gets 12 points and like a board and a couple of assists. I, I think that would be great. Jacob, you have said this, and I know we're going off a little bit off topic, but it's the truth. If this team plays themselves out of a five or six seed by winning the tournament, by win by winning the conference tournament, by playing themselves out of first place, and I know I'm acting like the the world is on the sky is falling down. Um, but yeah, you are playing yourself out of seating. Uh, you know, Jerry Palm and and Joe Lenardi, I couldn't think of his name, had, you know, they're going to get an 8-9 matchup against like Nebraska. I mean, think about it. It's hypothetical. You've had, oh, it's cool. They're going to get St. John, St. John's. St. John's is going to punch them in the mouth the way they play. And it's right. ironic that that team is in New York City. I mean, I'm watching, I've got Villanova and 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 Seton Hall on right now. Seton Hall, Shaheen Holloway got to an elite eight with a school that nobody had heard of. And the only reason I heard of it was because I took a train near there by defense, by they stopped Purdue. They, you know, North, North Carolina did beat them pretty extensively, but they, they got them there. I, I know that uh, there are Lobo fans that think it's okay. And this team is talented and we think deep, but you have played yourself out of seating and you're going to get like North Northwestern or Nebraska or St. John's or Seton Hall or God forbid, you know, an SEC team. And Jacob, you alluded to it last night. If Tennessee is the sixth best team in the country, this tournament is going to be topsy-turvy because a and and Buzz Williams got them big last night. I, I know I'm going off on a tangent because this is the things that I like and not the X's and O's things, but it, it it's I, – I think about Joe – and it's funny that we're talking about this on Super Bowl Sunday. I think about Joe Thiesman when he said getting to the su- – don't think that getting to the Super Bowl and great is losing because it's not. Getting there and winning there is great. They got there and they lost, and then he said it the next year. They got blasted by the Raiders, and – I I just feel like we are destined to get to the tournament and getting <laughs> destroyed. I almost said something from uh, "It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia." There, and I stopped back, Eric. But it's they're going. They could possibly get destroyed in the first round by somebody from the Big Ten or the SEC or the Big East. But you are you are the bigger guru than I am on that. And Rick drove that point home. Jacob, just your thoughts. Yeah. Well, I mean, right now they have like you know. Texas sitting on like the seven seed line, right? And well, if we were an eight or nine seed before last night and we lost to UNLV, which is going to hurt them a little bit in the bracket, you know, and they drop to like a 10 or 11 seed, you know, you're looking at playing a top 25 team in the country in the first round of the of the NCAA tournament at this point, right? Um, somebody like Texas is going to kill them down low with no, and they have multiple guys that they could bring in. Right. And and you want to talk about length. There's only a couple teams in this conference that have lengthy forward slash, you know, that can play that hybrid three, four or even that hybrid four five. We don't see very many of those players in that in this conference that can do that. And, and some of those teams have amazing players that can do that. We will struggle with that. And, you know, if if we're struggling with teams like UNLV um, at home it's going to be rough uh, in the tournament because we, that that's a step up in competition for sure. So one, one final thought is I, I think Lobo fans in general and the team, they can't even be looking that far ahead right now. I heard Amzil on the radio call after the game last night and they they asked him a final question about looking forward and he's saying, yeah, this is a tournament team and we're looking forward to go to the NCAA tournaments. Like, dude, you have a long way to go before that's even a possibility. You should just be thinking about Nevada. I don't want to hear any more about NCAA myself because that's still in question for me. 
And I still, like I said, the first time I came on this podcast for the Lobos, unfortunately, if they don't win the regular season conference or the conference tournament, it's usually a toss up if they're going to get in or not. And unfortunately, it'll probably be that way again. I texted Tom Moser last night and Jacob said the same thing. You always say it. <laughs> and when we're gambling, it's like we're in trouble. They're in trouble. I texted Tom Moser of uh, the coach, Tom Moser, of the podcast, uh, um, top of the mountain. And he said, they're in trouble. Uh, you know, acting like the sky is falling. Well, I mean, it's just, just some stats from, from Steve Kirkland. This is the first time this season that the Lobos have lost when leading at the half, uh, it was a season low with that 35.4%. And then they, sh- I didn't know this. They shot 29% in the second half, which was the lowest, uh, half in two seasons dating back to Air Force last year, I think when they lost on the road. Um, again, th- kudos to them for cutting, taking the lead down 12. That was great. That I just thought about it. And Rick, you had said it, I think, in text message, like, how the hell are they up? Um, and then this is the big one. And UNLV men's basketball, the page tweeted this out. They have won. UNM, UNLV improved 16 to 15 all time at the pit. The only visiting team with a winning winning record in the building with a minimum of three games, and they've won 10 of 11. And they tweeted out, Pete, the pit, Pete. They tweeted out the pit East. Uh, and it was the third sellout of the season for the Lobos, which I'll get in trouble for. We brag and we talk and oh, we're this, co- you know, I love the pit. I think it's great. And now I'm contradicting myself. You saw the, if you watched Utah State and the, uh, experience at spectrum last night, uh, at Utah state, the spectrum center. It was phenomenal. I see what grand Canyon does. And I, I hate to say it. Alan Fieldhouse ain't got nothing on the pit, like the pit, or excuse me, the pit ain't got nothing on Alan Fieldhouse. It was, it's always wild. I do love the pit. I respect it. I think it's a top 10 venue in college basketball. I just think there, there are a couple that we, we talk it up and I wish that Lobo fans, it's, I think the pit and Ed, you're going to criticize this for me. I think, I think that the pit is a bunch of guys who didn't go to UNM just yelling at other players, <laughs> um, but it does get loud and it's, it's, it, I, I get it, but uh, you know, we take pride in it and it's the only third sellout of the season. And we're in the middle essentially of February with a couple of home games left. That's just all I'm saying. Um, does anybody else have any final thoughts before we get to the snake of the game? Well, yeah. what I do on that about the pit, you know, I uh, I don't think we can uh, ever underestimate the power of the pit. I don't. I really don't. It's a great venue to watch basketball. Whoever's in there, snakes or whoever, you know, whatever uh, reptiles are in there, man. It's a great place to watch basketball. It's an intimidating place. And last night, you know, a, a sellout and, you know, the two straight home losses, that hurts. But, you know, so I uh, I would never underestimate the power of the pit, not ever. But, Rick, to your point, you know, you got a great point there, man. You better take care of the road ahead of you before you start thinking about any NCAA tournament. That kind of comment to me, that just you know, after you just got beat, that that thing is. Uh, what are you thinking? What are you thinking, man? We just lost. We got to take care of uh, Nevada, San Diego State. There is a, a, a Utah State. There is a very tough road ahead, and that's what your comment is. We're looking forward to going to the tournament. If you haven't been there since 2014. Better take care of what's in, uh, in front of you first. If I was Coach Patino and I heard that, I would be very, very upset about that, man. You gotta imagine telling Coach Segura that, telling, "Hey, we're gonna, win. <laughs> we're gonna." <go. laughs> oh man, I can only imagine. I know Coach Segura. You played for him, you know. My son played for him and coached with him. Hey, man, <laughs> you imagine saying that to him? Oh man, wow. Before yeah, somebody I'm, would be throwing up in practice. Oh, the next- <laughs> you did right. You did. So did so did my son. You know, so anybody that played for Coach Segura knows knows what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm sorry, Ryan. Go ahead. No, it's uh, I'm thinking about all the the hard ass coaches at St. Pius that none of them I played for. Um, I think about Tristani, <laughs> Ed, and Rick because I'm gonna name I'm gonna leave a friend out of this. Uh, I'm gonna leave him nameless. Uh, he was a starting goalie, and he farted once in a post game talk and got suspended. And that's a truth. <laughs> That's a true story, Damon Lacero. Uh, Eric, go ahead. I just want to mention one more thing regarding the wrapping up the season, right? Coming down this final stretch, it's it's tough. They got really four really hard road games. They still host Colorado State, but those are five 
Q1 opportunities for the Lobos, which could either really help their net and get into the tournament or really hurt them at the same time. So I think a lot to be determined, but it's all going to come down to these games down at the end of the season. These five Q1s could definitely, I mean, if there's an opportunity there for them to really improve their resume and uh, we're going to find out a lot about them. But I think, yeah, in a nutshell, I think they need to figure out uh, some of these matchups. I really liked Rick's uh, point that he made earlier on figuring out what what these matchups are going to look like. It's okay if we keep other guys in a little bit longer. It's not necessarily about who receives the most minutes or who's taking the shots, but we got to make sure that we're we're out there playing chess, not checkers. That's a valid point, and I wanted to go back to Jacob on this, but it, and then the schedule for UNM is uh, February thirteenth at Nevada, nine o'clock CBS. Well, it's Pacific time. Friday night at San Diego State, the gauntlet of death. Then home against Colorado State, and the way they've played at home, nothing's given. I think that Nico Medved is a is a great head coach. Uh, they should get Air Force. They, they'll get Air Force at home at Boise. I'm going to that game at Fresno, Utah State. So they could potentially go two and four down the stretch. They go six and oh, I'm not trying to act like the sky is falling. You go six and oh, hey, yes, good, good for us. But Jacob, to your point, and I was going to look it up on Ken Paul, UNLV and their inconsistency. We think you we're, we beat UNM's inconsistency here into the ground, which they've been pretty consistent over the, the, the season. But UNLV, if I saw the stack right, correct, and I'm doing it off the top of my head, I think it was a reporter in Vegas that UNLV has like four quad four losses, but yet four quad four wins. Uh, I think they that that is a, the win last night up to set up for a bit. And I don't know, we put money on them against UNLV uh, against Air Force, and Air Force came out and looked like the 1989 1999 run 1990 running Rebels. I, I didn't get it, but they are like the weirdest, they might be the weirdest, they might have the weirdest resume in all of college basketball. And I think that there's some argument that maybe they are, you know, I think they have to win the conference tournament to steal a bid because you don't want to lose the Air Force. But that's bizarre, that's bonkers, Landon. Jacob, I'm just going to throw that to you. Yeah, uh, I think that this is a team that could definitely steal a bid um later on in the season if they get hot i mean you could see what is that four in a row for unlv i think that's four in a row wins uh, yeah four in a row for unlv let me take a look, um, let me take a look. if that's the case there you go yeah, I mean, they could, yep four wins yeah, in a row they could get hot four games in a row and win the tournament i mean for sure but um yeah when you have a team that's so bipolar like that four quad one wins four quad four losses i mean that's going to hurt the Lobos more than you think it does. I saw that they only went down, I think, three spots in the net. Um, but yeah, that's just because, players. yeah, that's just because these guys, you know, this conference has gotten a good reputation this year and they've played, you know, decent. Um, they're beating up on each other, right? So they're just helping their own wins and everything. Um, so it didn't really hurt them as much as it should have. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I'm not I, – I'm not uh, – <laughs> enthusiastic at all about losing to UNLV um, twice in one season, especially with, uh, you know, what's coming up ahead. If you're the committee and you look at UNM and UNLV and UNLV maybe makes it to the conference title game and they're sitting at like, I don't know, 20 and 11 or something. If you're the committee and you see that UNLV swept them and beat them in Albuquerque, I would probably put money on it that if that puts UNLV on the bubble, the committee would. And then again, the name, I know it was 34 years ago, but the name and, and K Krevin Kruger in 2007 got them to a sweet 16, that name recognition. I would imagine that I keep doing this with my hand. Here's a piece of paper well, that, uh, uh, that they would put them in the tournament. They would put UNLV in the tournament over UNLV. I th and I think a lot of what we don't or what, you know, a casual fan of college basketball doesn't see is how much they weigh, how you finish the season compared to how you started the season. And this really works against the Lobos coming up because they have the toughest part of their schedule coming up at the end of the year. And if you go into the tournament at like two and six, but you're 24 and eight overall or something like that, they're going to look at how you're playing coming into the tournament. And that's going to hurt you, even if they are against quality teams. 
they want the teams that are playing their best basketball at the end of the year. Um, so that's going to be tough for the Lobos too. You know, I know I was going on a rant about how at that current point last week, they shouldn't have been an 11 seed. That was at that current point, but looking down the stretch, if they keep this, if they keep this up and they go like two and six down the stretch, they ain't going to make it. Let's just be honest. Look at Utah state last year, how they got in. They got but hot. The- they were, Go ahead, go ahead, Rick. Let's say the good thing about that is there's a lot of opportunity for the Lobos with these road wins, and they can climb up if they, you know, rattle off three out of those four. Mm-hmm. So they have a lot of opportunity in front of them. So I think it's also could be a good thing for you and them. Yeah. Oh, no, 100%. no, 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 totally. I think if they, if, if they win at Nevada and at San Diego State or they go two of three, they're in the tournament. Like the committee, I mean, not rated R the way the committee has looked at San Diego state and their lover. Uh, and I have to say it again, I'm a San Diego state defender. It, it, uh, they would, they would have to put them in the tournament. Like there's no way you, you can't, you can't split. You can't like win two or three of those and, and be like, ah, they're not in the tournament with how good the conference has been. I just fear going to Utah state the last game. (laughs) And there's always the revenge factor. They've beaten three of these teams. They've kicked their asses. It's been a savage beating. I, you know, that that's what scare that's what scares me. But for all the negativity that I spew out of my pie hole, there is real opportunity for this team to not only probably still win the conference, but get a better seating and maybe win, maybe do the sweep with the regular season and, and the and the tournament. Eric, you do you have anything to say? No, yeah, no, just I agree completely with what Ricky was saying. I think they have a really good opportunity in front of them still. Season's not in the bag, but we also um, can't treat this UNLV loss as bad as as we are because they've actually played a pretty tough schedule. And in context, that first part of the season that they really struggled, that they lost to some questionable teams, they were also playing without one of the Boone brothers. And I think we can all agree that when they have both Boone brothers on the floor at the same time, this is a completely different UNLV squad. Very different. It's like the kid from Rutgers, uh, Jacob. He's been on the – they're 3-0 and with uh, – whatchamacallit. Is it that Williams kid? And they're a completely different team. I watch Rutgers basketball, so it's – Ed, uh, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but do you have any final thoughts? Sorry, I think you're looking at your phone. <laughs> no, no, no. I No final thoughts. I think everybody uh, pretty much – you know, again, Rick, that's a good point. New Mexico still, still could uh, make something of this uh, – a bad you know, I guess uh, we're probably concentrating on the two back to back home losses, but they can they can turn things around and they've got a tough road ahead of them. But we'll see what we said this about a couple weeks ago. We're gonna see what they're made of pretty soon. And here it is. But they can definitely turn things around with a good performance at Nevada. San Diego State's a tough place to play, but you mentioned that if they uh, win at those places, they're in the tournament. So they've still got it's all is not lost. And uh, I don't want everybody to think we're all just negative when they lose. We're not. We're just calm, seeing things as, as we saw them last night. But certainly things can change going forward for sure. It's called checks and balances, even from somebody who didn't play high-level basketball. All right, it's time for uh, Snake of the Week or Snake of the Game. Um, and this is a Snake of the Week, bro. I love when they they cut to him. Uh, he It was fantastic. I'm going to give you guys some thoughts, uh, give you guys a moment to think about your Snake of the Week. Um, I think my snake of the week, again, it can be, we haven't defined it. It can be whatever the hell you want it to be. Um, I give kudos, even though I just took a big fat dump on the UNM fans at the pit, they did successfully do a wide out. However, what they're zero and two in wide outs. And I know a lot of people on Twitter, um, complaining about that, but I think that they, uh, it's, you know, it's still cool atmosphere. I mean, the, the, the San Diego state game, I got there late and I was on the ramp and the place, you know, I'm looking up and it's just there's nothing like it. I would love to go to Allen Phil house. I would love to go to Viejas. Uh, I think about that, <laughs> that play by play woman that everybody hates here for calling him Eddie house and not Jalen house who during a Colorado state game, she said, act, she went to CSU, but she said, activate Moby. And I just have like a robot voice in my head saying, activate Moby. Um, Jacob, I will start with you. What is your, and this is a snake of the week, bro. <sighs> wow. Um... <laughs> I want to make a joke, but I'm going to keep it clean. Um, so uh, I'm going to go with Washington last night. I think he stepped up big time. 
Um, you know, him off the bench was a big uh, plus for for us. And like we said, I think that he could potentially have finished out the game uh, plus 20 uh, in the limited amount of minutes that he got. That's a that's a good game for him. And he had been struggling, I think, up until last night. Um, so I think his performance off the bench last night was needed. Uh, he was effective. He, he, he's, he filled up the stat sheet for the minutes that he had. Uh, so I'd go with uh, True Washington last night as my snake of the week. Rick, I'll go to you, your snake of the week. I'm going to go with uh, JT Toppin, even though he didn't get a lot of touches. He still stuffed the stat sheet, 12 rebounds, five blocks, eight points. Um, you know, he's he's never out there not hustling or, or doing what's asked of him. You know, I just want to see him get involved in the offense a little more. And he's even shown the past three or four games that he can shoot the three. So um, just really like his game and uh, impressed with him. So he's my reptile of the week. <laughs> Uh, Eric, to your reptile of the week. I'm just a snake of the week, bro. Bruh. Bruh. I don't know if we've ever given this award or our recognition to anyone on the other team before, but uh, I'm going to have to go with Deaton Thomas. And the kid's 18 years old, should be a high school senior right now. Put up a cold 25 with one of the best defenders in the country guarding him last night, and he did it with a lot of poise. And really made the Lobos look bad. So I'm going to have to go with uh, Deedon Thomas on this one. And throwing it over to Mr. Ed Nunez. I'm going to go with uh, Donovan Dent last night. He had 20 points and uh, still the catalyst of the Lobos. had made, made some plays when they needed him to make some. And I think Jacob's absolutely right. They need the ball in his hands more. You know, again, when you have a two-guard system like that, though, it's going to be tough. The house is not going to give up the ball. He's not. That's the way it is. But I think he, uh, Donovan Dent, played well uh, when New Mexico needed him to. So that's my snake of the week. Uh, I have one more because we're not the only people who criticize. Uh, this is in Thursday's Sports Speak Up, which Ed and I are still the only people who subscribe to the newspaper. So, Rick, you can take a big fat dump on me for that one. Um, this gentleman, Chris Lally, wrote in, quote, prediction. Remember, you heard it here first. What happened to the Lobos meant he, this guy should buy me a, not a dog beer. Um, what happened to the Lobo men's basketball team last year is what it's, <laughs> is what is about to happen to them this year. They have most of their remaining games on the road, many of them against tough teams. They will lose most of their games. That's Richard Patino's history, especially where he came from in the Big Ten. The Lobos will not make the NCAA tournament. Chris Lally. So, hey, I ain't the only one with that. Hey, Eric, I'm going back to you. Can you just talk about what our partnerships with our sponsors, uh, Affordable Solar, the Colorado State game, and then where we'll be next Friday night for San Diego, for Wales Vagina State game? Yeah. So, once again, the Affordable Solar partnered with us to offer a promotion for an upcoming game. I think we go ahead and decide that it's going to be the Colorado State game where They'll provide tickets, uh, two tickets for someone to go through their website. Uh, we'll provide the link below. Fill out the form. Include hashtag the pit press in the comment section when you submit it. Uh, and you go ahead and arrange a free consultation to uh, transition your home to solar. At least find out how much it's going to cost and what the benefits might be with doing that. And then with our other sponsors, uh, we're going to be hosting a watch party or co-hosting a watch party next Friday night. Uh, February, February 16th at Turquoise Desert Tap Room. Uh, come join us. Come hang out with us. Get some free swag. We got some few giveaways. Uh, we're also going to do two ticket giveaway with them to the uh, Colorado State game. So plenty of opportunities to get some free tickets to some upcoming games, uh, exclusively on the Pit Press podcast and our sponsors. So thank you for them. Thank you guys for listening, and I, I hope you guys sign up and enter the contest. Um, also check out Road to the Pit. It's a high school journey high school basketball journey show nick ed and his son nick nunez uh host it um they do a great job doing it um we've had bell behind uh, tease uh tease our guest this week i'm sorry didn't mean to interrupt it'll be a academy senior forward joe jack who uh was part of the state championship team last year with academy and a very good player and uh so he'll be our guest uh this um uh, episode of the uh, road to the pit that's awesome um give us a like on uh head over to our youtube channel uh hit like and subscribe um 
call me <laughs> call me a bunch of things uh on twitter hey the pit press nm on on x formerly known as twitter head over to our instagram page at the pit press nm and also visit our website at the pit press nm.com uh i think it looks fantastic hey um this is uh check out our youtube channel hit like and subscribe i already said that on behalf of rick thompson jacob neff eric malton and mr ed nunez my name is ryan tamori we will try to talk to you post uh preview nevada but we will definitely be post nevada everybody have a great rest of your weekend have a good week we'll talk to you soon